Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Katz. I'm, uh, I'm a law professor at Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago Kent College of Law. I'm also affiliated faculty here at, at Stanford Codex. Uh, this is the panel on perils and promise of predictive analytics and law. And one thing I think you'll see on display, and it's on display in the in the two panels this morning is there's a division in legal tech between sort of rules-based AI approaches and data-driven AI approaches. And um, this panel is going to uh, talk about the, uh, the data-driven side of the, of the AI question. So the panel features uh, uh, four leaders in this space undertaking uh, different work, applying predictive analytics and law, and I'll introduce them in just a second. For those of you who aren't familiar, predictive analytics and law is basically the application of machine learning, natural language processing, and sort of data science tools to various problems uh, that we have in law. Um, we're going to talk about both the perils and the promise. Uh, we've been encouraged to, to also to make note of the perils. We're, we're, good on, we're, we're pretty set on the promise typically around here. Uh, uh, so I mean, I think some of the questions that we might pose or, or think about are reflected in, the, uh, uh, in your uh, agenda, but the, a couple that I'll just make sure to, to note is that we, we sort of lack a lot of technical standards that you see in other sectors uh, uh, applying these sorts of methods. Uh, validation of many of the models and methods is, is, is still fairly lacking. Uh, um, we also have questions about bias, statistical and otherwise in these models, fairness, power, unforeseen consequences, privacy, and a range of other uh, uh, issues as such. So, okay. Uh, so our, our panelists are as follows. Josh Becker, CEO, Lex Machina. Uh, Gypsy Escobar, Director of Analytics, Measures for Justice. John Ney, who's the CEO of Scopus Labs and a fellow at Vanderbilt Law School and uh, Deera Nevin, who's e-discovery counsel at Proskauer Rose. So here's our ground rules for today. Each of the panelists is gonna offer as uh, up to five minutes of opening comments. Then I'm gonna pose some of the questions from the agenda and we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation uh, around some of the promise and the, and the perils. Uh, we will then open it up to the room thereafter. My job as moderator is to ruthlessly enforce those time limits, so uh, uh, I may just have to cut somebody off mid-sentence if it comes to that, but, but, but the panelists have all promised to behave themselves and stay within the contours of the five minutes that they've been allocated. So I hope we can have a, a, a good conversation about where we are in, in uh, predictive analytics and law, and so I'll, we'll open it up with, uh, with Josh Bechter from Lex Machina. Josh, take it away. All right. Well, thank you. It's great to see this conference grow every year and, um, uh, and be on the panel with these, uh, all these distinguished folks. And I have to say, Dan is one of my personal heroes. I kind of wish I was moderating and he was speaking so well, we could hear more. This is my agent, so uh, you can... Uh, we'll hear more, yes. <laughs> and it's always good to butter up the moderator, too. Yes. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, it's fun for us to be here. As many of you know, Lex Machina started as a public interest project at Stanford Law School. And... It's important to remember what was the goal of that project. And I will tell you, the goal of that project was to provide openness and transparency to the law. So the goal of that project was not to come up with some computer, some algorithm that you just uh, you know, adjudicates cases where you feed in lots of facts and it spits out you know, who should win. Um, you know, it's not a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which for those of you guys who know, right, they're trying to f come up with the uh, ultimate question, the answer to the ultimate question of life the universe and everything. And so they build a computer and it runs for seven and a half million years and um, comes up with the answer. Who knows what that answer is? The answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything? 42, yes, 42 is the answer. Um, so uh, when Roland asked me um, to join this panel, I was, I was flattered, but I had to say, um, you know, we're very um, cautious at Lex Machina about using the P word. Um, uh, which is how we refer to it uh, for predictive. We're much more, um, much less about predictive analytics and much more we think about driving data-driven legal decisions, right? That is our goal, driving data-driven legal decisions. So it's really about replacing anecdata with actual data. Anecdata, by the way, being one of my favorite words. So we're at a board meeting with Mark Lemley, who many of you know, and he was talking about to the non lawyers in the room, how, how law really runs today. And he referred to this, this notion of, you know, it's really anecdote based, it's really anecdata. So that's really our goal is replacing anecdata with actual data. So let me give you a couple examples of uh, what I mean here. Um, one example the GC of a large pharma company um, had a very important ANDA case. ANDA cases are a particular kind of pharmaceutical uh, cases, very prevalent. And it was before Judge Chesler in the, in the uh, District of New Jersey. And the GC had heard anecdata 
that this judge often ruled on claim construction and ANDA cases without holding a hearing. But he also heard opposite to that as well. So we analyzed Lex Machina data about Judge Chesler and found that, yes, 80% of the time in ANDA cases, the judge did, in fact, not hold a claim construction hearing. So the GC directed his attorneys to put all their arguments into the pleadings and not hold back their strongest arguments for a hearing, which was unlikely to happen. And it's important to note that this approach was directly contrary to their normal course of uh, uh, doing this, uh, their strategy. And what happened? Well, the judge did not hold a hearing. Um, the company prevailed on claim construction, setting them up for a favorable settlement. Uh, another example is a partner at a large Texas firm where there was a motion to dismiss um, that he was evaluating whether to file on behalf of his client, and he looked in Lex Machina and said, God, there's, only about, there's about a 2% chance of this motion actually winning. And he shared that data with his uh, client and said, you know, listen, I'm happy to do it, but you know, here's the, the statistics advise them not to file. And they agreed, and so you know, he cost himself probably 10, 20K of legal work in the short term, but built lots of goodwill uh, in the long term. And so, you know, so those are a couple examples and happy to give more as we kind of go along. But I think the other important part and one of our philosophies is you have to be able to drill down to the underlying data, right? So with Lex Machina, you're always one click away. So you can look at the stats and see that, um, you know, this certain judge uh, uh, rules and you know, grants summary judgment motions a much lower percent of time than other judges. But you can then also drill down. Let me see the last 10 summary judgment motions that she uh, granted, and let me see the last 10 summary judgment motions that she denied, so then I can make you know, conclusions for myself. So we think that is uh, a really uh, critical piece on this. Uh, another example, a judge in the Southern District of New York, where if you look at the first blush, you say, oh, this, this judge is very uh, plaintiff friendly. But then if you look at Judge Securities cases, which very prevalent in Southern District of New York, you see actually slightly plaintiff friendly. And if you look at just uh, last three years of securities cases, you see very plaintiff friendly, um, or sorry, very defendant friendly. So you have to be able to drill down. It has to be iterative. And I think that helps um, really realize the promise and, and uh, you know, kind of limit some of the perils um, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, thank you very much, Josh. That was to the second of five <laughs> minutes, so thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> Gypsy Escobar is going to uh, follow that uh, follow that great lead from Josh. Uh, uh, that, that's going to be a, a, a difficult second act. Um, so um, I'm the director of research and analytics for Measures for Justice, and uh, Measures for Justice basically is a nonprofit that started six years ago uh, with the idea of bringing transparency to the criminal justice system by creating a, uh, a system and performance uh, measurement uh, for local criminal justice. Um, so we always talk about the criminal justice system as if there was one, but in reality, you know, in 3,000 uh, 3, plus counties in the United States, there's 3,000 plus criminal justice systems that, you know, operate uh, under the same st statutory laws, um, but that were practices very widely. So we've uh, spent the last uh, six years coding, um, First of all, collecting the data um, for 10% uh, of those counties for, uh, in six states, you can uh, go check out the uh, data, uh, preliminary data in, in the hallway um, at the break. Um, and we've learned a lot from not just the data, but talking, also talking with the people in the field. So we, all, we, we use administrative data um, to create these measures, but we have to validate. First of all, we have to standardize, right? Because you know statutes are different across uh, uh, states. Therefore, charge descriptions are different as, across data sets, and practices and language is different as well. So that's taken a, a while to figure out how to standardize these practices. But we think you know we're at a point where we're comfortable enough with it that we're we're launching um, our data portal in May. But. Doing this work um, with the data has really given me uh, not just an insight, insight on criminal justice, but on the potential of using data to augment um, decision making in the criminal justice system, um, as, as Josh was saying. Um, the goal should not be to have 
uh, machine learning or an algorithm spit out the decision for a, the, the, the outcome that it, there sh it, it should happen in a, in a given um, case, either at pretrial, um, the pretrial stage or at the disposition or sentencing stage. But the goal is to provide the, uh, the judge with more information. What Measures for Justice does is actually very, very descriptive. We do not do predictive. Um, all of our measures are percentages, medians, and rates. Um, they're shown in kind of like in the distribution across the count, uh, uh, across the state. Um, and the idea is to allow not just the public. Originally, the idea was to bring transparency to the public, right? So they knew what was happening in the criminal justice system. But the more that we've talked to stakeholders and practitioners in the field, we are learning that is this will also bring transparency to the practitioners, to prosecutors, to public defenders, to judges that are so into the weeds of the of you know disposing of case by case by case that they're not seeing the forest, that they're not seeing the problems that the potential problems that there could be happening in their jurisdictions. So what we want to do is highlight areas that will need further investigation. An example of, of this I'll give you. Um, we, uh, you know, Wisconsin was the first state where we collected data. We've been working with, uh, with prosecutors and uh, uh, public defenders there um, and judges to kind of like validate the data. And one of those prosecutors, and I'll say the county because he doesn't mind, uh, in Winnebago County, Wisconsin, he found that he had some racial disparities and some uh, disparities in the outcomes for pretrial release um, in, by indigent status of the defendant. So he saw this data and he actually started acting on it even before we launched the, 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 the data portal. He, he went in and like dig deeper, right? Um, actually contracted with the University of Wisconsin in Winnebago to figure out what was happening and he's already making policy um, out of this. So that's the point of, of this. It's, like, it's kind of like uh, allowed for the pres uh, descriptives to lead to more informed decision making. Now, in terms of the promise of, uh, uh, of uh, data analytics and predictives uh, for, for the law, um, I will say that it will, could be a very good potential way of reducing disparities in the system, disparities for defendants that uh, have come from different backgrounds but that committed the same type of, type of offense. The cautionary note here is that we try to do this before in an analog way, right? Think sentencing guidelines. We try to use sentencing guidelines to, to get, do away with racial disparities and disparities of, a, you know, basically class disparities as well in uh, sentencing outcomes, but it hasn't worked that way, right? It ha we haven't gotten rid of, the, uh, of disparities. And another thing that we have to think about is when we start using the data, um, from, from particularly from administrative systems uh, to feed those algorithms that could help us bring about this information. First of all, data is a big ocean of diversity across agencies and jurisdictions. So standardizing that is very difficult. But we always talk about implicit biases in the actors of the system, right? Prosecutors have implicit biases. It's not that they're racist, right? They, oh, we all have an implicit bias. We also have to think about how we, uh, by creating code, that analyzes and creates an algorithm that brings, a, a, say, a score for the risk of reoffending that is going to decide the pretrial detention status of the defendant, which has you know, trickle-down consequences down the line in terms of disposition and sentencing. We have to think about the questions that are going into that algorithm and whether those questions have implicit bias. One example I'll give you is one of the most used um, uh, uh, risk assessments, uh, uh, it's called Compass, and you've probably seen it in, the, in the news. One of the questions they use is whether the defendant had parents, uh, whether the defendant's parents had been incarcerated before. Well, I'll tell you what. Not one in nine African-American children in the United States have had a parent incarcerated compared to one in 57 of white children. So that question, even if the, uh, if the algorithm, the tool is not using race as one of the predictors, the question itself has implicit bias by the way in which you know, our society currently works. So I think obviously there is promise. There is promise to help um, augment the judging decision and like the dispositional decisions. Um, but we have to be very careful about how, what kind of information we feed into the predictive analytics to make sure that they're not also you know, leading to a biased, um, biased result.
Thank you very much. So I think you'll see across the different panelists that we have a bunch of the different sub-verticals within legal covered, and obviously there's many more use cases if you look across uh, the predictive analytics space. But So let's pass it over to John Nay from Scopos Labs. Yep, uh, thank you. So, so, John, uh, so take it away, John. Yeah, the vertical I'll talk about mainly through examples is, is policy making. Um, so how do we interpret and use insights from data? I think we can divide this into three things, prediction, explanation, and description. And within prediction, we can do forecasts. So looking forward in time as a prediction, for example, there's a 20% chance this bill will be enacted into law. Um, we can also do predicting unknown values, not forward in time, um, but things that are currently existing or have existed in the past. So e-discovery, we're predicting things with that. Um, what bills are most relevant to the bill that I'm working on now? That's another prediction problem. Um, within explanation, we can divide explanation into two different types. One is an explanation of a prediction. So, uh, for example, uh, this bill has a 20% chance, and that's because of X, Y, and Z. It's because the bill is introduced in the Senate rather than being introduced in the House, and that decreases the probability by X percent. So an explanation of the prediction. We can also have explanation of a phenomena. This is causal inference. This is the core of what social science is, the core of economics and econometrics. And so this is really hard. Um, with having an actual X causes Y is, takes a lot of work, and you have to find the right way to do an experiment or a natural experiment to then get that explanation. And that's a lot of times when people say explanation, that's more what they're talking about. It's more of a causal inference type of thing. Um, third is description, and an example of description is 4% of bills that are introduced are enacted into law. So um, that's a lot of what Josh was talking about is they do a lot of description. Um, so that's how we can use data um, and interpret that and, and make it useful. Um, machine predictions versus human predictions. Um, that's sort of a crucial distinction here. In a lot of situations, predictions are being made by humans, but it's not explicit that they're actually making a prediction. They're advising that, okay, this policy is coming up, it's, it's going to affect you in this way, but they're implicitly making a prediction that the policy is likely to actually be enacted into law. So there's predictions being made, a lot of times not explicitly by humans. If they are explicit, they're not testing the predictions. There's no back Tra tracking of the actual performance of the predictions. If there is, then the user are not doing it well. So predictions being made not explicitly, not well tested. If they are tested, not, they're not make, doing the predictions well. So that's why we should move towards machine predictions rather than human predictions. Um, machine predictions in law are most useful when there's enough data available to train the system and when the fundamental relationships between the variables that are used in the system are not changing. So we, we're applying it in time now, we're gonna make predictions in the future, the, the fundamental pr the relationships between the predictive variables and that outcome can't change too much. That's another thing we have to have happen. Um, the outcome that we're predicting is important. That's obviously um, an important thing for machine predictions being useful. Um, you can do something about it. It's an actionable thing. Um, so this bill has this percent chance. We still have a chance to increase the chance of the bill being enacted. There's an actionable thing that can be, be uh, taken based on the prediction. I'm going to return to that in a, a second. Remind me if I forget. Um, when the predictions are provided as probabilities, that's another thing that the machine um, is, is good at doing. So the, a 1% chance versus a 49% chance is a huge difference, but they're both um, classified as not happening. So we want to make these probabilistic predictions. And that's uh, a little sidebar there is what we care about is expected value. We care about the probability of event times the outcome. And that equals the expected value. And so, um, for example, the, uh, the, there was a uh, stimulus bill in 2009, $831 billion cost to the bill. That's the outcome. If we just changed our prediction by 0 0.1, um, that's eight, $83 billion. So it's, it, that's what expected value is. It's the, the probability of an event times the outcome equals expected value. And so that's an important to keep in mind. That's why we would do probabilities rather than just yes or no's. Um, the ex explainability of the predictions is important. But we should keep in mind that what is the existing solution? So existing right now is human brains. Human brains that are attached to human bodies and human emotions, humans that lie, humans that can't explain how they actually made a decision, even if they are truthful, they might not be able to explain how they actually made the decision. So that's the existing solution. And so when we're designing new technology, we should think about an ideal world and try to create that ideal world. But when we're choosing to adopt technology, we should not compare new technology to an ideal world. Let's compare it to the existing solutions that we could actually adopt right now. And so the existing solutions, the existing alternatives are human brains that are not able to explain themselves. So let's compare it to that. Let's not compare it to what would be ideal. Um, in, in, uh, what, but let's, when we're designing stuff, let's compare it to what's ideal. 
Um, and uh, to come back to what I mentioned earlier about you can do something about it, another point I want to make is this, is this is really tricky because a lot of times when you use a prediction model and it's being widely used, that's a great problem to have, by the way, but if that happens, then you can actually change the world by using the prediction model and then in that way make the prediction model not working. And so that's another thing we need to keep in mind too because you're actually changing what I mentioned before is that fundamental relationships between the inputs, between the predictive variables and the output by using the prediction model. One example is around crime. If the, it's, we're predicting that the crime is going to happen here, we act on that, we reduce the crime, and now the model's wrong and the crime's not happening there. Um, so we got to think about the feedback between predictive modeling and between the real world and how that works together. Um, and uh, oh, I'm over my time. Sorry. I'll, I'll come back to more stuff later. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. He's self-censored. I appreciate that. Uh, I, uh, recall the drone. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, Dira, I'll pass it over to you for, for your opening comments. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different than what Dan expects. So I'm okay. e-discovery counsel at Proskauer Rose, but the disclaimer is I'm speaking on my own behalf here, and I okay. appreciate if you're... Um, blog posts and no, tweets. That's noted that. for the record. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually not going to talk about e-discovery, although I welcome questions on the application of machine learning and computer modeling in that domain. What I'm actually going to talk about, because I represent, I think here, the, the active practice of law. So what happens when you actually meet the client? I'm going to talk about attention, emotion, and disintermediation. I'm going to do it through a very basic question that a lawyer might receive, which is, I want a divorce, right? We can, we can imagine that situation to be true. So I just want you to put a pin in that. I'm going to come back to it. I read with great enthusiasm the, the write-up of AlphaGo's um, matches against Lee Seedall, in particular in game two, the notion of this move 37, which was a move that the computer did that no human being could foresee. And the computer, in fact, changed the game. A human beings in interpreting that move um, ended up with a new understanding of the game. That computer rewrote the rule, um, which was how players approach the tactical approach of the game, the outside of the board versus the inside of the board. And now human beings play more complex, more challenging games of Go. So we hear that one of the benefits of so-called predictive analytics or data-driven decisions is that it can make things transparent. It can expose our biases. And you've heard some of the other panelists talk about that. That is the fantastic opportunity, is to reveal either latent biases that operate um, within our social constraints or just information that we don't have to drive better decisions. But the thing about a lot of the systems where these um, decision or these applications are currently coming is that they're games or they're closed systems. And not all law is a, is a game or a closed system. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. It's a highly complex system. And unlike most um, things that we were hearing about with the Google X Labs sending rockets up, the, the thing is law moves through time. Human beings do not stay situate. If we think about what law is, and Professor Hadfield talked about this, is that it's a general storytelling system that is applicable at the general level, but it is experienced or enforced at the specific level, and it's not enforced equivalently across all people. Some people don't have access at all. Some people are able to access, access it. It's, it's also true that law is a storytelling machine where people approach it either with acute needs or chronic needs. And the acute needs are often more unpredictable. By an acute mean, I mean it's an individual who has a specific need, unlike a business that has the same need over and over again, enforcement of contracts or dealing with slip and fall claims. So the role of the practitioner is to really understand what needs enforcing and to what ends. And to that, we need to understand, the, are the ends based on logic or emotion? And that's what um, some of my co-panelists have talked about. When we talk about emotion, we need to talk about the critical role that the lawyer, and that's currently the function within our legal system that plays that, but if there's um, a, a devolution of the regulatory framework, whoever that is plays an important disintermediation role in making manifest or transparent what those ends really are. When I was a young lawyer, I had the opportunity for, to prepare a brief that I thought was going to be amazing. It was going to create new law. I, we, we should do this brief, and we should bring this motion. But my senior partner said, wait, let's not file. And I asked why. And he said, I need time to make a better client. And it took me a long time to figure out what that meant. And that is that, like the question, I want a divorce, that has a defined and specific answer. But if the reason for that is really a momentary frustration, not based on a breakdown of trust and respect, then divorce may not be the right answer. It may be counseling. 
and it's a lawyer that's going to help the client understand is the decision making process based on emotional factors or logical factors? How should the law operate in that context? And so as we start to introduce human components, I think the role of the lawyer, and that's, that's a cipher, a term, it's somebody who is able to make the decision-making process either through making data transparent, so we're really making logic-based decisions rather than, than emotional-based decisions, or making the emotional-based decision transparent so we can evaluate whether it's truly a legal issue. But those emotional-based decisions don't necessarily need to get deflected from the legal system. Those are often the inflection points that our system needs to adapt to a new social reality and change the stories. And so we need to make all of this more visible. We can't blindly follow the law. We do need human beings to really assist in sorting through and particularly dealing with what our computers can't deal with, the fact that emotion, human emotion is complex, it's messy, and it's not algorithmic. And we can't, at this stage in our technological development, necessarily account for it all because we're not honest and truthful with ourselves. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to pose a couple of the questions uh, to the panel and, and uh, I'll let whoever would like to start uh, in terms of responding. Um, one question that people have raised with respect to the application of these models, um, uh, John, I think, uh, raised this a little bit, is comparisons to alternatives, validation of these methods and models applied in this context. I wonder if, uh, maybe I'll just start with, with you, Josh, if you might say a little bit about um, how we might go about validating some of these methods and models. Uh, uh, um, I mean, and, and do I mean what the, comp the question that was posed in the in the uh, uh, in the agenda is? Uh, do you feel that analytics companies have a responsibility to disclose the sort of method by which uh, these systems arrive arrive at answers? Uh, I think so. Yes, um, because this is kind of thing come up in some of the comments is that you know, statistics themselves can be misleading, right? My example of the Southern District of New York. If you just look at this judge at a high level, across all cases, you say, oh, defendant friendly, right? But when you dive into securities cases the last three years, which is really what this particular client was interested in, you see that's not the case at all. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think it's very important that um, not only disclose um, uh, that, uh, you know, how to come up with the measures, but again, also, I think exposing the underlying data itself so then people can look through, especially in law, um, so people can look through and, and come to their own conclusions, right? Again, you may see the stats, this judge is much more plain and friendly than this judge or other things, um, but you may, you know, you, hey, great, let me actually, or you know, this judge has only granted summary judgment in 2% of cases, great, let me look at those 10 cases and, yeah. and analyze, you know, maybe these are extreme arguments or whatever, right? You know, a certain judge has a certain win rate, I mean, a certain attorney has a certain win rate, let me go in and see, maybe that, Attorney took harder cases. So I think those, the analytics really can be a starting point. Good, good. Well, Gypsy, I wanted to ask you, I mean, one thing that could be said about judges is that they're the ultimate black box model. Right. And so uh, 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 when we hear the sort of question about whether we should use algorithms, say, in sentencing decisions or uh, parole and probation, um, it is kind of, to me at least, it's a complex question because uh, you know, we have uh, lots of studies about racial disparities in the justice system, and we have the ultimate black box as the current implementation model. So I think it's, it's at least a somewhat clouded question about kind of moving to algorithms. It's uh, uh, in the fear of algorithms being biased. I mean, we have, a, a, we have an existing approach that, that has some of those, those elements. I wondered if you could say a little bit about that in terms of uh, uh, your work. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think I'm just going to chime in um, what Josh said in terms of transparency and, uh, you know, as a social scientist that, like, you know, in social in any science, really, like, that's what you do, right? You, right. you, you, t you, talk pe you tell people what uh, variables you use, how you measure them, how you collected them, what method you use to analyze it, what, you know, like, all, all the part of the descriptives, and uh, what weights you give to your, to your variables. So that same thing with, with, the, uh, uh, with the algorithm. But another important thing in understanding Understanding, and this is kind of part of, the, part of the black box, is understanding context, which is what uh, Josh was saying in terms of like getting into the more fine-grained information could lead you to a diff completely different conclusion about an actor within the criminal justice system. So I think it's important, um, the, <laughs> and there, whether uh, an algorithm eventually, you know, 50, 100 years from now, ends up becoming the judge. And judge, you guys are not going to be useful anymore. Like everybody, like, you know, everything is going to be done by a computer. Hopefully not. I, that raises a lot of moral issues. But the, the bottom line is that even when we're using an algorithm, it could be the most perfect algorithm, it has to be interpreted by a human. 
So that's where that black box comes into, into play, right? The black box should, um, the black box of the algorithm itself, first of all, shouldn't be a black box. It should be public and it should be known to the defendant if it's going to be used to determine their uh, pretrial detention or their sentencing or their disposition. They should know what evidence is being, against, uh, is being used against them to you know, put them in jail before trial. Um, but also to make sure, we need to make sure, there needs to be a much wider discussion, which I don't think is necessarily happening for a lot of these um, you know, risk assessment tools of what needs to go, which questions need to go, be going in there. So that those implicit biases that like, you know, like we're not really using race as part of the algorithm anymore, but we're using questions that are race correlated, right? So that's part of that. And then how we help the practitioner, the judge, the black box of the human mind to interpret that, I think we have to not just give them a score, but we have to ha also have to give them the context, right? So you, you, you know, like this, and this is happening within this um, uh, cir circumstances, this person is coming from this neighborhood, or like these decisions are being made within these uh, types of, you know, like population distributions, poverty rates, you know, like uh, 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 police enforcement happens in this specific way in this, in this jurisdiction. So we need to understand how like the, the, the the full context of a, deci uh, a decision um, ca can help the, the score that this algorithm spits out be used in a more uh, socially responsible way. Okay, very good. So, John, I wanted to pose uh, so two things that, that came out of what uh, for what you said. Is one, you talked a little bit about out of uh, out of sample validation, back testing. Yep. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. And also, I just wanted to pose to you kind of if you could say a little bit about the range of methods that are out there. Some, like we have true black box sort of methods like neural nets or what have you, and then we have things like, say, random forest, which is a much more transparent approach. Maybe you could say, we've talked a little bit about at various points in time, the, the sort of trade-offs that exist between performance and sort of uh, opacity, I guess you might say. It, what was the first thing you wanted me to talk the about? The first thing was just validation, out of sample, back testing, what have you. Yeah, so for that, I, I can give an example of some of what we do. So um, we pretend as if we're in 2014 and we only train the system with data up until 2013. And then as if we're in real time through 2014 through 2016, we, um, for one of the things we do is predict all of the, the outcomes of the bills that are been under consideration for the 114th Congress. Um, and then we look at how well we're able to do that. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, it's really important to make probabilistic predictions. And so um, the main way to evaluate that is something called calibration. You look at all of the predictions that you made that were between zero and 20% chance. For those predictions, how many of those were enacted? And you want that to be around 10%. And now you move up to the next bin. Because what we're saying is when it's a 5% chance, 5% of the time, it actually will be enacted when we said it was only 5% chance. And so that's not wrong. That's just probabilistically well calibrated. Um, and so you go back and you back test um, and you try to do that for as much, as much time as you can. And then you look at a variety of metrics around um, probabilistic predictions. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a lot of literature about the best ways to, to calibrate and to validate. Um, and uh, that's, that's really important to follow that. And, and then the second part is about, uh, what was the second question? The, the sort of, the trade-off between oh, right. opacity yep. and performance of models. Got it, yeah, so um, there's, yeah, there's a wide spectrum. I mean, today, every, like AI can mean like a linear model with two variables. Like AI is used for everything. But um, so within AI, you could have something from very simple, you could have like a one, uh, you could have a linear regression with one predictor variable and you can just interpret the coefficient on that predictor variable and that will give you how that model is thinking about the effect of that variable on the outcome. Um, and so you can go from that, you can also have decision trees uh, that are just like one tree and each node you split one way or the other and you can interpret that and say this is how this model makes its decision. Um, and then you can go beyond that and have many trees, forests of trees, so you can have increasingly complex ensembles of models that are better able to make predictions. Um, and then sort of the state of the art right now for predictive modeling when you have a lot of data is something called deep learning. And so these are neural networks that have many hidden layers within the networks. Um, and uh, because of advances in hardware and algorithms, they're, they're relatively um, easy to, to adopt that type of modeling. But one of the, the downsides to that type of modeling is it's harder to understand what the model's doing. 
because you have many nonlinear and higher level interactions between the inputs. And that's why it's so capable of, having, of learning a potentially very complex function that maps the inputs to the outputs because it's so flexible, but then that makes it really hard to interpret how all of those different parameters are connected to each other. So for some of these models, you literally would have millions of parameters, and there's no way you can interpret what all those parameters mean. But one of the things that you can do um, is you can sort of treat that model as the data generating process of the world. Um, you can say, let's pretend this model, these inputs and this output is how the world works, and now you can manipulate that model in a way to try to back out how the model is making its decision and vary some inputs to the model and look at the effect on the output. And then from that analysis, this sort of meta model of the model, then you can begin to learn how that model is making decisions. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a, a big thing that we're, we're pioneering right now and um, trying to, to have ways that are best able to provide um, these insights about explanations and at the same time have highly predictive models. So Dira, you said something earlier in your, in your comments uh, about human decision making and algorithms and we're not, we're, we're not quite there. Maybe you could say a bit, little bit more about uh, uh, both in, in general and then maybe a little bit if you want to in some of your work that you've so, done yeah. in, in discovery. So I can do that. Um, what I think the, the work that Josh and John are doing is they're making visible our hidden assumptions about how law functions. It is an algorithm. It's, a, it's, an, it's an analog one that is full of bugs and holes, but, it, but that's really what it is. When we bring a case before the court, there's a whole system of pleadings and rules and all of this kind of stuff. It is an, it is an algorithm. The opportunity we have as we go through the digital process to, is to do two things, is make our assumptions transparent, and also if we actually change the infrastructure and add some bandwidth to actually generate a lot more law or legal outcomes, right? So a big part of what we've been talking about is not just a problem with the law, but with our legal infrastructure and creating additional bandwidth. We're in the dial-up era. Of, of a lot of our legal infrastructure in terms of, of access to justice. It's a bandwidth issue. Um, what I really mean by that is um, there's a dimension of the algorithm where, as a lawyer, I have to reality test not only my client's assumptions in terms of the facts, in terms of generating the outcome, but that critical process, as Gypsy said, of refining the question to make sure that we're perfecting the question. Because the amazing thing about the legal algorithm is the outcome is often a function of the input of the question. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the role that lawyers are actually trained in law school, and I hope we don't lose this, is, is issue spotting. Issue spotting is actually intended, although we don't make this manifest and explicit to our lawyers, of how to ask better questions. And among the questions that we need to learn how to ask and maintain our ability to ask is those probing questions of our clients to determine what their interests really are and whether they're, what they're saying is actually aligned with what they desire. So when you're dealing with a corporation, often those two things are a lot closer. Um, but the, the, the risk of being a lawyer is that you implement exactly what your client says, and it turns out that's not really what they want, and you've, you've put it in through a system where they get exactly what they want. And that's why the opportunity to, to divert out of the algorithm is actually critical when you discover that there is that misalignment. Good. Well, so I wanted to pose the second question from the agenda. We'll understand the, the odds dissuade otherwise important cases from being adjudicated. So this is called the data calcification problem. The idea is that sometimes people are actually bringing cases that are a, somewhat of a mistake to be brought, but, but the, the act of bringing them themselves actually, uh, bringing in something as a 10% chance, but, uh, uh, but that 10% hits is actually, uh, an, uh, is actually kind of a unique opp opportunity. So mistakes have actually been good for the law at various points in time. I wonder if people w had any thoughts about data calcification. John, I think you said a little bit about that earlier, right, in your own? Yeah. Your opening comments, um, but anybody else also after John is welcome to jump in on that. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, this comes back to the expected value thing. So it's pr the probability of something times the outcome. So I, I don't think if it's a, just a mistake, it's worth doing. So, yeah. it, but if it's a deliberate thing, and it, so we have we have a small shot at this. But if this works, this could change. This could go to the Supreme Court. This could change the way civil rights is done in the U.S. Something like that, where yeah. it's a we have a low chance. Let's understand our chance so we can, uh, we can uh, devote the resources in the most efficient way, but let's multiply that chance times that amazing outcome. And so we wanna, we wanna be able to more effectively and, and intelligently search for what we're trying to do. Um, and so that we wanna take into account the odds, we wanna take into account the probabilities, but we wanna multiply that by what we care about. Um, Gypsy, I wonder if you could say a little bit about this too in the in the criminal uh, justice system. I mean, there's obviously a tremendous amount of plea bargaining, which is this sort of people looking at their view of what the odds are, and then 
even potentially uh, choosing to take a deal maybe when they're innocent, right? Because right. they just, the prospects of the, of the ultimate sentence uh, are, are so, so strong and the deal is so good, they, they feel like they have, right. they have to say yes. Uh, that sort of at least feels like, a, like an element of this question that's relevant to your right. work. Yeah, no, absolutely, because uh, uh, you know, we, in, in criminology, we know that a splitting in the shadow of the trial, right. like, you, you know, that we're convinced even by our, you know, defendants are convinced even by the defense attorneys that plead, like, going to trial is gonna lead to worse outcomes. Um, but to get to, to get a little bit uh, uh, to the, the what you were talking about probability and, and yeah. tied with outcomes, particularly yeah. when outcomes are life changing and have you know dire consequences, not just in the criminal justice. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know, like I'm a criminologist, so crime is my thing, but um, not to do crime, but to study. <laughs> um, uh, well, that's but, a calculation as well, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but when they're so dire, so the, the consequences are so dire, not just for the defendant, but for the co family of the defendant, the community where the defendant comes from, and, and in general for society, right? We have to ask, the, we, it's, it's basically a question about what is worse. Um, because with probability, we're gonna have false positives and we're gonna have false negatives, right? So what is worse? A false negative where we let somebody who might have committed a crime go, or a false positive where we convict an innocent person, right? right. Which is what the Innocence Project has been working on for, for some years now. So it really is a, a moral question and a cost-benefit analysis question, right? It's a moral question in, in, this, in the sense that, okay, so you let a rapist go, right? Serial rapist, there was no enough evidence, um, you know, like we could not prove it, and the algorithm could not, you know, tell us that the probability that uh, reoffending uh, was uh, high at all. So we let him go, right? Um, you know, what is the moral cost and the social, the social cost is like, you know, there's gonna be more rape victims, right? But we also have to, and I don't have an answer for this, by the way, but we also have to wonder when we convict an innocent person, right? Uh, because the algorithm said that this person had a high chance of having committed the offense that he's accused, he or she is accused of, usually more, <coughs> um, uh, and that, the, that he or she had a high probability of reoffending, right? That also has very dire consequences, right? Like we are, we are taking away a potentially uh, productive member of society, incapacitating him, um, you know, with all the consequences that incarceration has for human psychology and you know the possibility for reentry and all that stuff. We're taking potentially a father or a mother away from a family, a breadwinner, right? Uh, a member of a community that might have whatever level of standing in that community, and when you start aggregating those false, uh, false positives. In, in, in certain communities, which do happen in certain communities because of the implicit bias of the criminal justice system, um, then you have a huge societal problem. So the probability, as it is right now, um, and even though there have been a lot of advances in statistics in the last uh, uh, two decades, uh, probability will still spit out false positives and false, neg false negatives. And as a society, what we need to figure out is which one is morally and socially and in terms of cost cost benefit analysis worse. So I'm gonna let Josh and Dira uh, offer some additional thoughts, but if folks wanted to come up and ask a question, if you wanted to queue up on either side, we'll, I'd like to open it up after that to the, to, the, uh, to the audience here. And we have some great folks obviously in the audience here who, who I know will have uh, some thoughts on these questions. So please just feel free to queue up and, and uh, but I'll put, pass it over to Josh. You said you wanted to say something, then I'll go to Dira. <laughs> Yeah, for my, my sort of uh, fun example of that, although not quite so fun, I just came from Atlanta, it's not fun for Falcons fans, but you know, the Super Bowl at one point, you know, the Patriots had a 1% chance of winning the Super Bowl, yes. and you know, they didn't just like, fold up tents and say, okay, we're gonna go home, yes. right? They uh, if said- If only I had placed a, an in-game bet in yes, the third quarter. Yes, that would have worked out well for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, and so, um, but I appreciate Gypsy bringing up the, the very uh, real world and very dire consequences of uh, of this in the criminal justice system. Another example from the medical world, there's some evidence coming out of machines uh, viewing scans um, of various biopsies and such. And, um, and yes, there may be an error rate of one, two, three percent, but um, it's now well known that, for example, the humans viewing mammograms, actually the error rate is about 20, 25 yeah. percent. Um, so, um, you know, an example where machines can can right. help us make better right. decisions. The one other example in our world, in the patent world, um, is around settlements, right? So we had a lot of companies um, coming to us. They want to see uh, where they rank compared to their peers um, in settlements, because in patent lawsuits, they realize, well, you know, we don't want to be settling 
we don't want to be on one edge where we're settling 95% and we're sort of seen as an easy mark, and we don't want to be necessarily at the other edge where we're, you know, we're competing, you know, we're uh, contesting every case and spending a lot of money where no one else is. Um, we want to be kind of in the middle, okay. right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so there might be some cases where we know it's actually economically better to settle, but we want to make a statement, right. and so we're going to contest right. that case. Oh, dear, do you have any yeah. other comments? I we also have, we have four folks have here. Have one. I, so I think the question is a good one, but yeah. I think it's a misplaced one, and that this okay. is what the justice system has always done. Okay. It's just now we actually have some numbers. Okay. Right. So if you think about it, a hundred years ago, people still had to take an evaluation about whether to prosecute a claim right. or enter right. a plea bargain, but now we can actually quantify it and give people information. Um, that may aid them in their decision making. There's a bit of an adage in, among the trial lawyer crew, which is, you know, when you're dealing with a client and they are um, wanting you to do something and you don't agree that that's the correct course of outcome for the client, is you have that conversation with the client where well, you can be smart or you can be right, and one's going to cost you more. And there are situations, like in the pursuit of social justice or in the pursuit of trying to stretch the law, even on, on, on contracts, where being right is important because the, the outcome or the cost of not being right can be life-altering, or you may not get the patent, or it may not achieve the business objectives, in which case, despite the odds, you need to make that change. Um, and then there are cases where pursuing that outcome will be very expensive, and it may be emotionally driven, there may be a business reason, there may be a political reason, there may be a process, a legitimate process reason to contest that claim. But the availability of these numbers helps people make more calculated decision, and I think will contribute to, um, to a better allocation of resources. So we have a few, a few folks who want to ask a question. I'll ask you to keep the questions a, a somewhat focused. No speeches from the floor. And so I'll, I'll uh, introduce yourself. Uh, please introduce yourself and ask your question. Dirk, you want to introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, my name is Dirk Hartung. I'm Executive Director for Legal Technology at Bucerios Law School in Hamburg, Germany. I think we can all agree that law depends on social acceptance. And it seems that so far, most people accept judicial decisions. So my question is, how do we create that same level of social acceptance with decisions based on predictive analytic models? Just three sentences of context. Um, Josh and Gypsy made very, a very clear case for transparency of the decision-making process. That sounds great. John mentioned how hard, in fact, it often can be, especially with deep learning, to actually understand what happened. Mm -hmm. And Dira has repeatedly stressed how incompatible humans, their emotions, and machines can be. So I guess my question really is, how do we create social acceptance of decisions based on predictive models while the vast majority of people cannot figure out how they arrive at it? Very good. A fair question has been put to the floor. I'll, I'll, I'll let whoever would like to jump in on that. Well, yeah, so I, don't all step everybody's forward staring, at once. He named every one of you, so you're all equally. So it's the same way that through time human beings have evolved to accept a judge as an arbitrator of decisions. If you think about it, when you're having a dispute with somebody, why on earth would you go to some man or woman and 12 random people you've never met to help you decide that? It actually makes no sense, but in the context of our society, we've accepted that. So we've accepted that also because those people reflect back to us stories that we believe to be true and accept our notion of social ordering the way that we as a, as a society understand it. If you see the history of our laws and our society, there have always been conversations on the outlier, start, sometimes starting from the inside, about why we believe those stories to be true. And this is going to be another example. There'll be a different way of creating stories, and our society will either adapt or not to that new way. And so I have no other answer for that, but I believe in the plasticity of human imagination to be able to come to that conclusion. Josh, you want to, or uh, Gypsy, if you want to say just a couple words, make sure we we'll get to everyone, but go ahead. Uh, I will just add to that. Um, that we, as uh, scientists that are tackling legal issues and social issues, need to be, get better at making the, not just the data, but the information accessible to the public. And by that I mean to make it understandable by people. Because when, you know, I, I have a, a PhD training where they train in statistics and it's like you have to follow this annoying format to report your findings that only other criminologists and statisticians are gonna understand, right? But if we wanna make it so that there is, it becomes socially accepted, right, that uh, we're using the predictive analytics, we gotta make it accessible to the public so that they can understand what we're talking about. And this is a learning process for people in computer science, statistics, and so, you know, any kind of science. Um, that takes a lot of work in, in, in 
uh, feedback, the feedback process that uh, Professor Hatfield was talking about before in getting how, you know, getting to your intended audience, whether it is uh, an activist, a journalist, or a prosecutor, or, you know, a, a patent person. I'm not familiar with that part of the law. But, yeah. um, but uh, you know, to, to get the information to them, get the reaction to it, say, I have no idea what you're talking about, uh, explain it to me in lay terms, and start working that process to explain it in, in, in lay terms so that like, more of a social consensus can emerge. Because part of the, we're at fault of, being, of, be, of the black box as well, because we make results and data incomprehensible to most people. So that, I think that's part of the process, make, making it accessible to people. Josh, you had a, uh, something you wanted to add? Or? Well, I was going to quote Dan Katz, which is, I think the answer Please is- spell it. Take as much time yeah. as you need then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is, you know, humans plus machines, right? And that's really how, how we see it. But it's a great question. I'm reading the book right now. It's about, you know, um, conspiracy theorists and, and, you know, science deniers and look at anti-vaccine or, or GMOs are, help, are harmful. And, and it's really interesting to see how the brain works, right, and how these sort of people sort of develop these kind of group think around some of these issues. So I think it's really critical, but I think the answer is it's really about, you know, humans plus machines and the machines themselves not just create the answer. Good, good. Well, let, let's uh, get a couple of the other questions out on the table. Uh, okay, great. Uh, Scott Rentz from uh, Kravath, Swain, and more. Um, so uh, data analytics and data science assumes that there's data to analyze and to conduct scientific experiments on. And um, so, and a lot of the examples that we've talked about today have been data in the context of decision making by courts, um, which is just, you know, one area of legal practice, arguably not even, you know, sort of the majority of the kinds of decisions that lawyers advise on. So is there, is there a, um, you know, a data gap, a data deficit. Um, are we, you know, capturing the right types of data? Where do you see opportunities to capture more data so that we can bring analytics to bear on more, you know, on a wider spectrum uh, of the legal problems? Good question, John. Nay, uh, you you didn't jump in before. Do you want to do you want to say a couple words about yeah, that? Sure. Um, so. Uh, the, the hard part in the legal field is that a lot of the data can't be shared, um, especially like a, a law firm, they, they wouldn't want the, the data to go to another law firm or to anyone else outside the law firm. So um, I think, I mean, so what we focused on is publicly available data um, and bringing together like very disparate sources of data that are potentially relevant. Um, and there's a lot of data out there that you don't even realize is data. So like everything on the internet um, can be scraped and can be s somehow structured and can be learned to be useful depending on other events that are occurring at similar times. So um, it's, it's a lot about getting creative about what is publicly available and bringing together a lot of disparate sources. Anybody else want to, you want to say a couple words, yeah? I can say millions of words about that. Okay. Um, so you can do that on Twitter, 140 <laughs> characters at a time, but yeah. Uh, so, but I'll keep it to a couple of words. Um, so we do live in an era where there is a lot of data out there, right? Um, that, that, you know, that part of uh, my work in Measures for Justice is collecting data and evaluating it and assessing it and then turn it into something that is consumable, right? Um, the problem is that there, there's multiple problems. One, data are not being collected consistently or reliably across jurisdictions. Um, different jurisdictions, and I'm talking, again, just criminal justice. Different jurisdictions and agencies within the same jurisdictions are collecting not just different kind of data, but data that doesn't talk to each other. So the prosecutor data doesn't talk to the jail data, doesn't talk to the court data, doesn't talk to the police data, right? Um, but there are opportunities. There, uh, and particularly in areas that we are not measuring right now, like re the data that is being collected by, by criminal justice agencies is basically case processing uh, data, right? So, you know, like what hearings happen, the dates, uh, dispositions, blah, blah, blah. But there is also an opportunity to start collecting more information about, for instance, in public defender offices, um, how soon did the public defender meet with the defendant after the case was filed? How many times they have met? This is information they do not collect. They, on, they only care about the processing of the case, but not about the relationships between the different actors in, in the system, the, the networks within the system. So there is opportunity there. And then the other opportunity is that as more of us use data and make it you know, out for public conception, there is more need for better data and for more data collection. And I think this is, uh, at least in the criminal justice area, 
is, is a place which, you know, a lot of the data is public access, so that's, uh, that's kind of like an advantage of it, is, is going to, uh, the, the, the fact that we're using data, their data, is bringing awareness about the limitations of their data, the type of data that they're collecting, and how they make it public or not. So I think, I think there is uh, definitely areas um, to work in. So we have about uh, three minutes to left. I'm gonna let you ask your question. I'm gonna prime our panelists to say, I'm gonna let each of you have a final word of 30 seconds after we take this question. So think about making something as good for Twitter as possible, and I'll ask everybody in the room to fire when ready. So your question, sir. Sure. Please introduce yourself. Adam Ullman, inventor, entrepreneur, IP specialist. Oh, that's, that and, sounds cool. Yes, uh, good. Your, your comment about Twitter is spot on. So we're yeah. talking about predictive analytics here, and you're, you're focusing on the positives. Yes. How we can change outcomes to what we're going for. But this is in its infancy. And as you're talking, I'm real, I'm thinking of the movie Minority Report. How far away are we where your Facebook feed, your Twitter feed, and your other actions are analyzed and it says, hey, there's a 99.5% chance you will commit a crime, at which point you are arrested before it happens. Okay, so I there think are, this there is are a good question for Gypsy uh, uh, in particular, given uh, her Far research. away and not that far away. Um, there is a lot of projects on predictive policing that are happening out there right now that use things like that, uh, uh, Facebook feeds, Twitter feeds, um, that uh, look at you know the pe people's uh, social networks, like actual, not Facebook, but actual people they know and like their, their criminal records and stuff like that. Um, I think there are a lot of problems with that, though, because um, that is predicting crime at the community level, uh, you know, like hotspot policing and stuff like that. That's good, right? Like we, we focus on space, geography, you know, like things that could happen in that geography. But when we focus on individual people, then there a lot of due process questions start to happen. Then we're not assuming innocence. Then, then we're assuming guilt by association. So. That is an area where policing are moving to, towards. They want to do that. They want to do minority report. Um, but I think as a society, we have to talk a lot more about the implications of that and how and the implications that that has for due process. Okay, so we've come to the end here. 30 seconds each, your, your most tweetable quote. Uh, I'll start on the end, Dira. Okay. Um, so, Adam, that's already happening in um, unregulated um, predictive analytics is already being used in some respects in assessing everybody's um, condition as an economic actor for credit. So that's already here. So that's why the role of mediation and my concerns about disintermediation are so important. We do need somebody to constantly critically evaluate how the algorithms are working and make our um, assumptions manifest so that we can evaluate whether or not these models are behaving in the way that we want them to. John Ney. Um, yeah, I'll just go with that question. So. Uh, Sort of my philosopher's hat is like, uh, like what is free will? And maybe free will is something that's on a spectrum where if it's like almost completely predictable, we didn't have free will. And if it's if the machine learning model couldn't predict it, then we had free will. Just a random philosopher, philosophical thought. Okay, very good. Um, I will just say uh, augmentation. Right? Let's think about. AI, machine learning, deep learning, all that stuff as augmenting our human ability to interpret and, and make decisions. Josh Becker. Let's replace anecdata with actual data. And be careful about the, the P word. Think about driving data-driven legal decisions. OK, thank you very much. Let's, let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.